How is everybody tonight? Happy Monday night. Happy Monday night. Today is the 27th of December. Tonight we're going to be talking about how we can overturn Terry. And it's, it's super ironic that, that some of the things that you're going to learn tonight, some of the, some of the historical factors that you're going to learn, that you're, 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 you're going to want a pencil and a paper. You're going to want a pen and a paper because if you have the poster and, and a lot of you guys, Stephanie, I'm glad you're here. Let me, how do I do it, Stephanie? I'm going to add you, Stephanie, add moderator. There we go. So uh, Stephanie London is going to be moderating. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. Um, I don't mean to say anybody's name, so I'm not trying to be a... Anyway, I'll be a little more careful. Um, so how's everybody doing tonight? Thank you guys for coming. Um, so we're going to go into some pretty, some pretty gnarly history tonight. And I'm going to talk about... Now, if, now a lot of you guys, uh, I think uh, like five people have bought the poster in the past uh, five days. So that's five poster sales that, that, I, that I, I'm so grateful for. And someone picked up my ebook and I haven't had any sales in two months because I'm, uh, I tried to go on TikTok Live earlier tonight. I got banned really quickly. But tonight's lecture is going to be extraordinarily in depth. It's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge your thinking of the things that you've been told. You've been told a bucket of lies. So remember that. that I, I cannot give you the knowledge that I have in my head, if you have decided that what you know is already true and this is the way that it is, I can't disseminate the, the 20 years of constitutional law case study that I've done if you've already made your mind up. Because earlier this year, they talked about packing the court and so I'm gonna get into that, but you guys are gonna want a pencil and paper Stephanie, the cases you're going to want to reference are going to be um, Lochner versus New York, 1905. You're going to want to reference Atkinson versus Children's Hospital of District Columbia, 1923. You're going to want to reference Moorhead versus New York, 1936. You're going to want to reference Caroline Products versus the United States, 1938. Caroline Products is actually on the poster. So the, the five people who got a poster this week, I'm super grateful. Thank you so much. You have no idea. I mean, it is, <laughs> I mean, I literally could cry because I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not, I, I, I've been an executive several times in my life at big companies where I've made a lot of money. And every time I take a job as an executive, I take a, a job as an executive so that I can quit that job as soon as I've made enough money to invest in my own company and my own venture. And I've done that five times through life where I was an executive in Manhattan in 2013. I was an executive in a health company. I was an executive in a tech company. And I am not going to do that with my life any longer. I'm no longer going to break off and go run someone's company for a year and then come back and build my own thing. This is what I'm going to do. So for the five people who bought a digital poster for me this week, <laughs> I am so super grateful. I am beyond grateful. So you're going to want to reference those cases. Let me read them off one more time just real quick. Uh, thanks, you guys, for coming. Uh, hit your like button. I don't know how it works on YouTube like I do on TikTok. On TikTok, they sit there and tap the screen. That sends up likes and more people come. But it doesn't matter because this is going to post to YouTube. I, I want to do a special shout out uh, to Disorderly Product News. Thank you very much for um, the shout out of the audit that I did. The subscribers have not now gone over 10,000. Just a few housekeeping things, and then I'm going to jump right into it. I wanted to give Stephanie a chance to jump on that. Stephanie, if 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 you need to those reference those cases, it's going to be Atkinson versus Children's Hospital of District of Columbia, 1936, Lochner versus New York, 1905, Caroline Products versus the United States, 1938. You're also going to want to reference. We're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to go further back than that. We're going to go to the 14th Amendment of 1868, and you're going to have to really understand this. This is going to be some deep, deep stuff here because everything ties together. Oh, I'm sorry. You're also going to want to reference West Coast Hotel versus Parish, 1937. You're going to want to reference that case. You're going to want to have a link for, for, for West Coast Hotel versus Parish, and, and, and then we're going, to, we're going to jump right into it. 
So if you guys follow the channel and you follow what I teach and what I've been doing with my life, I have dedicated myself, my own person, to overturning Terry versus Ohio. Overturning Terry versus Ohio. Um, and so because of that, I have, I have researched every different possible way that we can overturn Terry. And I show this all the time. I should really just get another stick. Let me just grab another stick so I don't have to lose my teaching stick here. So I'll just grab this one here and I'll pop this right here. And so we're just gonna pop that back. Yeah, it's a broom. But there's the Terry v. Ohio stick. That stick is pointing up to Terry versus Ohio. And then right after Terry versus Ohio, there goes the prison state, police state. And over here are all these people are legally departed because when you put officer safety over our rights, then what happens is the exact same thing as the 1876 case of Cruikshank versus the United States when, you, when, you, when the federal government allowed you to strip away all of your civil liberties. And they, they literally say in the holding of Cruikshank that the federal government cannot ensure your civil liberties, cannot ensure your first 10 amendments. And without our rights, we are, are fodder for the government. We really are. I hate to say that because I'm not some big, uh, maybe I am, maybe I am, maybe I am. I, I'm not real proud of this government right now. And according to everything I've read from John Locke, from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, from Thomas Hobbes, from Montesquieu, the current state of affairs is leading us to a civil war. Now, I'm an intellectual, even though I like to fist fight. <laughs> so I enjoy a good fist fight, but I do not enjoy a good war. And so everything that we have learned from John Locke of natural law, as a matter of fact, I can give a quick quote from John Locke. When the government, when the government, I'm sorry, it's from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which by the way, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is one of the most beautiful enlightenment thinkers that you will ever take the time to research. And if you just put in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and it's J-A-Q-U-E-S, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and if you go and read some of the, especially from his two different books, where he talks about um, going to the park with your children, taking time away from everything else, spending time in nature, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is one of the most beautiful Enlightenment thinkers I have ever read, besides Carl Sagan. Um, you know, Descartes is not quite as beautiful, but honest and raw. So you know, the, the more you read of philosophy and of Enlightenment thinkers, then the more well-rounded of a human being you're going to be, the more you're gonna have compassion for your fellow man. Because Jean-Jacques Rousseau specifically his quote was this, and I won't get my ADD too off track here, but he said, when the government fails to uphold the social contract, the people have a duty and an obligation to revolution. This is a quote from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I am not calling for a revolution. All of the government agents who are spying on everything we're doing, I'm against a revolution. If we do go to a revolution, this intellectual leaves America. I am not gonna be killed by some moron who doesn't understand the basic tenets of how our country was formed. So I'm just kind of giving a, a few minutes for a couple people to come in to populate. We'll, we'll probably get 100, 150 people in the room. And so um, if you guys could, can you guys just drop down right here? I'm just gonna take a second and read the comments. Can you guys tell me where you guys are watching from? What city and state, what, what county, what town, what country? Can you guys just drop down in here in this comment section real fast? Let me know where you guys are watching from. Um, a patriot is duty bound to disobey an unjust law. Exactly correct, sir. Exactly correct, or ma'am. Yes, Buffalo, New York's in the house. Australia, how's it going in Australia? We could literally take five minutes here and just listen to what this human being has to say. Uh, Liberal Arts University revealed uh, great minds from the past. Lincoln County, Oregon. So Oregon was, was, was brought in the Oregon territory of 17... Uh, 17, was it 1745 or was it 1755? Is that when we took the Oregon Territory? Anaheim, California, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. And I believe we already, we already had Oklahoma. Oklahoma was one of the go bills. Uh, happy to, happy to hear you in Buffalo, Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan. I think, uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, make sure that you, I get you a digital poster, Stephanie, for moderating for me. I appreciate it. I will send you a digital poster for free. Um, uh, your comments been retracted. Okay, cool. So now, now look, we, we, if you've been to the channel, you've heard me speak in depth about how 
Terry versus Ohio creates the police state, prison state of which we are forced to live in today. So, so you've heard me speak on this on, I mean, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to saying you've heard me say these things. San Antonio, Texas is in the house. Hi, San Antonio, thank you for coming. I appreciate everybody being here tonight. Um, and I wanna talk really specifically because the solution to Terry has already been floated. It's already been said aloud in the last election. And everybody, just so you know, I saw a statistic the other day. I saw a statistic the other day and it was talking about America. And it said that 1% of America controls everything. 4% of America works for that 1%. 80% of America is, is uh, 90% of America is asleep. And 5% of Americans are you and I, the people who are awake, who want to change this bullshit system. And when I say this bullshit system, I'm not talking about the Bill of Rights. I'm talking about the police state, prison state that has been developed all going all the way back to Marbury versus Madison. And we touched on that a little bit yesterday where the judiciary just took the power for themselves. And so today's lecture is going to be about how we overturn Terry versus Ohio without have, so so let's let's just let's just begin okay sorry about that so so let let's just begin let's let's just begin let's let's just begin this lecture okay so in the beginning we have the constitution we have the constitution and the bill of rights and of course the constitution and the bill of rights can be amended these, these can be amended. As you know, we only have the first 10, and then we have the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, and then it keeps going down, 16th, 17th, 18th. And at different times in history, different amendments are passed because the 17th Amendment is passed in 1913 because senators have become so corrupted that we decide we're going to elect senators because they're colluding with big business to create riches for themselves and their families, but the people are getting shafted. And that we're not going to get into that specifically right this second because that, that's going to talk about Lochner versus New York, 1905. So now when you get to West Coast Hotel versus Parish in 1930s, so so first let's cover, let's cover real quick because there's so much material here, and I was thinking about how to prep this for you guys, and I thought just let me go on and talk. And once I start to talk, if I get a couple questions, then I'll be able to to, to really tune into exactly what I'm talking about here. So now, the 14th Amendment is going to be passed in 1868. Now, the 14th Amendment is passed after the 13th Amendment in 1865. We all know that the 13th Amendment says that slavery is abolished unless you get rearrested. And then from 1865 till 1868, you had a number of enforcement acts that were, were both executive order and legislated to try to stop the murdering of freed black people, if you could have called them freed in 1865, which you could not have. It's, it's, a, it's so now, but let's talk specifically about the 14th Amendment, because remember Montesquieu's books, The Spirits of, Spirit of Laws, uh, volumes one through nine, that book is going to be bastardized, used, cherry picked, referenced in both the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Every time that someone writes something that is extraordinary, you can use it for the left or the right. Remember, the Bible says uh, um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and then the very next line says, but I say to ye, resist this temptation, and if ye is smited on the cheek, turn and let ye smite the other cheek. But whether you're a proponent for the death penalty or against the death penalty, that passage from the Bible is used by both people who say an eye for an eye, a cheek for a cheek, or to turn the other cheek if you get hit in the face. So spirit of laws is used in both the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers for a weaker federal government and for a stronger federal government. The Anti-Federalist Papers is a response to the Federalist Papers. I don't want to get lost. So now what the 14th Amendment does after the 13th Amendment is passed, the 14th Amendment, what it's going to say is because... Remember, you have... An, now, this, this lecture is not about slavery. This is not about Reconstruction. We could go into Reconstruction considering, but we want to get as quickly as we can into solutions for Terry versus Ohio. So when the 14th Amendment is written and passed in 1868, what does the 14th Amendment specifically say? Anybody? Go ahead. Go ahead. What, what does the 14th Amendment specifically 
say? What is, what, is the, what is the wording of the 14th Amendment? I do not want to see a civil war either. I am against a civil war. I'm against violence. Do not break the law. Do not hurt other people. So with that being said, what specifically does the 14th Amendment say? Can anybody type it right down here for me? Tell me specifically what the wording of the 14th Amendment says, because I just want to see you know, how tuned in the Federalist Papers. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I appreciate that. that, that uh, that's a link. It's also available on YouTube. So you can do that link and get the YouTube and listen to it as you read the words. And that's how I learn. So can anybody tell me what the, I'm only going to give 10 more seconds here. What does the 14th Amendment specifically say? There's a couple factors of the 14th Amendment. They're going to come into direct play today with how we're going to overturn Terry versus Ohio without having to pass a constitutional amendment. So I guess as you guys are researching what the four, all person born naturalized in the United States and subjected to jurisdiction thereof and the citizens of state wherein they reside, no state shall abridge privileges or immunities with citizens of the United States, nor shall the state deprive any persons of life and then keep going liberty and property without due process of the law, nor deny persons or jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. And what that includes is the right to contract. You have the right to contract and I have the right to contract. For example, I can give you guys a contract right now that says that you agree to be here and so you agree to be here for the duration of the live stream. If you sign that contract and I sign that contract, we both have the fair right to contract with one another. And why is that so important when referencing the 13th Amendment? Why is that such an important factor? It's an important factor because when black people were supposedly freed with the 13th Amendment, which they were not, but let's just say that they were for, for, for the history's sake, because you do have the 13th Amendment, Juneteenth is still celebrated, even though it shouldn't be. And so then in 1868, what's happened is, is a lot of the people who were previously in slavery were then given, were then given what's called a peonage contract, P-E-O-N-A-G-E, a peonage contract. And so that is one of the catalysts for passing the 14th Amendment so that, how you guys, how you doing Dante? So that, that way you can write a contract and I can write a contract and we can sign it. But then equal protection under the law within that contract would mean that a judge or, or a judiciary or a jury would have to judge that contract fairly. It's not just simple equal protection under the law where the guy with the star on his chest is going to give the same equal protection to you that it does to me. It also goes into contract law. Now, this is a very, very important point to understand in history. You have to know this. You have to understand that the 14th Amendment, the right to contract with equal protection under the law, extends both to individuals, even if I was previously a slave and you're my, you're my, the, my employer, and also, if I'm a business, if I'm a business, and this is going to tie directly to Terry versus Ohio, and here's how it works. So when the 14th Amendment is passed and you get equal protection under the law and due process under the law, well, then they're going to write contracts, and this starts in 1868, where pretty soon businesses are writing contracts with employees, but there's only so much work, and so people are signing these contracts, and then up in 1897, 1890. Seven right here, one year after Plessy versus Ferguson is passed, which creates racial segregation, legal racial segregation, which is another name for um, tyranny, for the destruction of our country today. Are, are, let me ask you guys a real quick question. Are we still dealing with the problems that, that, that legal segregation caused? Are we still having to deal with that? Peonage contracts, sharecroppers, that's exactly correct, Douglas, thank you. Remember, there's so much stuff going through my head because I want to get to, it, it, it always takes 15 or 20 minutes to get to solutions because we have to go back in time if you're really going to understand history. If, if you want to understand this country and how we were created, you have to always go back every time we want to go forward. Every time we want to go forward and advance this country, you got to go back in time to see exactly what happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So... So now what happens here is in at, right after 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, where you have those sharecropping contracts, and I think peonage contracts die out, but you know what? I wasn't alive and I don't know everything. So, so, so now what happens is in 1896, when there's legal racial segregation, now businesses 
they're gonna create a couple different kinds of contracts. Business, and this is, gonna be, this is gonna be the beginning of what's known as the Lochner era of the Supreme Court. And the Lochner era is gonna go from 1897 here, right here, starting with the Fuller Court, 1897, and it's gonna go all the way through to the Hughes Court. Now, they say that the, the Lochner era is gonna end in 1937, but Caroline Products versus the United States is passed in 1938. So if, if, if we ended the, the Lochner era in 1937, then how in the world did the, the, Hughes, the Hughes Court give an absolute monopoly to the, to the dairy industry? And so that's just a little cliff note for you. And, and in Caroline Products versus the United States, in my ebook, I touch on footnote number two and footnote number three. However, uh, constitutional scholars and civil libertarians will often touch on footnote number four. I hope I'm not speaking over anybody. If you guys have any questions at all, please stop me and let me know because I want you guys to get comprehension because together we can overturn Terry. We just have to know how to do it. So the Lochner era of the Supreme Court is going to begin in 1896 and it's going to stretch all the way until 1937. And when I say the Lochner era of the Supreme Court, what I'm specifically referencing is the 1905 case of Lochner versus New York. Lochner versus New York is about bread bakers, people who bake bread, I swear. And what's going on in New York, remember, America's going through a really tough time. World War I is going to begin in the next 10, 15 years, 1914 to 1919. And what's going to happen is the bread bakers in Lochner versus New York is the bread bakers are forced to live at the table where they bake bread. They live at the table where they bake bread. They sleep on the table where they bake bread. And now try to put it into consideration that where you work, that where you work, you have, you have these gigantic furnaces, these huge, gigantic ovens that are, that, are, that are baking bread, and you are sleeping on the table of which you just kneaded the bread and put the bread together. And it seems like it's so simple, but it's not. And if you get into the, the minutia, into the detail of Lochner versus New York, you'll find out that the bread bakers who are sleeping on the table from the pipes above, you have steaming hot drips of water that are dripping down on top of them as they're trying to sleep, that are scolding them because the bread baking ovens have to bake all night. Remember, in, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century, which is the early 1900s, we are a country that is grappling with an industrial revolution where there's so many people, we have to feed so many mouths and we don't have an industrial food production company uh, set up yet. There's no real, you know, United Fruit is being formed, but, but, but that's the fruit company that travels around the world. But what I'm trying to say is, is there's no means of production for food like there is today and ha how our food price is going today. It's going horrifically bad, right? It's going, it's going tough. It's going tough. Now you buy a bag of food that you bought three years ago. The bag's half the size and the, the bag is t t twice the money. And so, so that's what we're dealing with here. So in 1905, uh, if you want to put a link up there, Stephanie, you know, and there is tons of videos on YouTube. There is tons of data on Lochner versus New York. But what happens specifically, without you having to go into anything else, is the Fuller Court in 1905 in Lochner versus New York, what they're gonna do is they're gonna rule against Lochner and they're gonna say, no, you signed a contract with the bakery. The bakery has the 14th Amendment, the right to contract and be contracted. And so Lochner, Lochner loses and so when you sign a contract with a corporation, with a company, what's going to happen is you have to fulfill that contract. And if you don't, then you're in breach. Then you're the problem. And so this ideology of corporations have the same equal protection to contract and equal protection under the law that individuals do, that concept has never left. And we know that because of the 2010 case of, uh, whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, I guess, I guess, I guess I didn't make this, uh, this step repeat. The 2010 case of Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. And so, so what we're gonna see with, the, with, with Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission 
is that corporations are people. So I'm just showing you how the ideology and the philosophy that corporations have the same rights as you and me has been going on since, since the early 20th century and even beyond. Because remember, Standard Oil, the Standard Oil Corporation is going to start in 1863 and that's going to be a, a J.D. Rockefeller. The Standard Oil Corporation is going to begin in 1863 and does J.D. Rockefeller get a couple years of slave labor plus a couple more? Yes, he does. The Standard Oil Corporation is started off with slave labor, like it or not. It's not always fun to talk about history, but it doesn't make me uncomfortable. It's just the facts. The facts of history don't care about how you feel. So it doesn't make me uncomfortable talking about it. So when anybody tells you, you need to be uncomfortable, they just want you to be upset. You don't need to be uncomfortable talking about history. History is history. Don't feel bad about it. Just realize that we've made some, that, that our forefathers made some horrible mistakes that you and I are rectifying today and some members of the black community are not helping. They're hurting the movement. They're hurting the movement for equality that all men are created equal, the philosophy by John Locke, which was then credited in the Constitution. So in 1905, when Lochner versus New York, when Lochner loses, then that is gonna be called the Lochner era of court. And that is gonna last all the way till 1937. And what happens in 1937 is a case called West Coast Hotel, West Coast Hotel versus Parish. So if you want to throw a link up for West Coast Hotel versus Parish, and so in case anybody didn't know, West Coast Hotel versus Parish is the beginning of minimum wage. So now, now let's let's take it. Like I said, every time we talk about taking a step forward, we have to look back in the past to find out exactly what happened. What happened was in 1923 in a case called Atkinson versus Elementary School of District of Columbia. I, I don't think I have that quite correctly, but it's, it's pretty close. It's Atkinson versus the school district of Washington, of the District of Columbia. And in Atkinson versus the, the, the District of Columbia School District, they rule against Atkinson. Remember, women are completely shafted throughout the history of our time, all the way up until the 80s. And, 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 and all the way up until the 80s. Remember, women don't get the right to vote until 1920 with the 19th Amendment. So women don't get the right to vote. Okay, there it is. Atkins versus Children Hospital of DC. Forgive me, I apologize. So it's Atkinson versus, uh, it's right there. You guys can click on that link if you want and then feel free to correct me if I ever make any errors. Remember, everything I know is just right there. I don't look up anything. I've already done the reading, so I'm just trying to regurgitate what's in my head here. So. Now, when you have Atkinson versus the, what was that again? Let me read that again, Stephanie. It was Children's Hospital of District of Columbia. I said it was school district, so you see I can make mistakes. No one's perfect. So now in that case, in Atkinson versus the, the, the teacher, lo the, 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 they, we lose. I, mean, I got to suck in my head as teacher. But we lose. And what happens is, is they don't uphold a minimum wage. Remember, we're going through a depression here. World War II has ended in 1918, 1919. And so now in 1923, when you have Atkinson's versus the Hospital of District of Columbia, we're going to lose that case when I think it was a nurse who wants minimum wage. And so what happens is when she loses, then no minimum wage. So now once again, you're having, you're having corporations, the hospital, use the 14th Amendment to say that they have equal protection under the law that they have a right to contract and be contracted and the law has to respect the corporation's contract as much as they do the person's contract. And so the unelected Supreme Court, which is gonna be the William Howard Taft Court, what they do is they uphold that ruling of Atkinson. So there's no minimum wage. So even though there's a depression and everybody's starving, there's no minimum wage. So then we fast forward again to the 1936 case, which is going to be Moorhead versus New York. And in Moorhead versus New York, again, this is a minimum wage case and the minimum wage plaintiff loses, lose the case. And again, it's the same court. It's the same court. It's going to be the Hughes court. I'm sorry, I'm sorry it's going to be the Taft court for 1926. 1936, Jesus Christ, I'm just a little, excuse my language. I'm just a little bit off tonight for some reason. I'm just a little bit off tonight. I don't, I don't, I don't know why I'm a little off tonight, but I certainly am. So now in 1936, when Moorhead versus New York happens and we lose the right to minimum wage again, in 1937, 
when you get West Host Hotel versus Parish, what happens? How come we have 30 years, more than that, almost 40 years of us of, from, from 1897 to 1937, we, you know, we, have, we have literally 40 years of a court that has refused to, to do any kind of morality, I guess you would call it. They actually call it morality in the 1937 case of, of West Host Hotel versus Parish. They actually use the word morality, and that's going to be from Judge Owen Roberts. Judge Owen Roberts is going to switch side when he voted for the Moorhead case in 1936. In 1937, Owen Roberts votes for Parrish in West Host Hotel versus Parrish. Now, Parrish is a maid. She's a woman. And she wants a fair livable wage. And West Host Hotel is not paying it to her because women have a different minimum wage. <laughs> I mean, it, I laugh because... In today's world, if you, I guess, you know what, we found that out from the Sony hacks in, when did the Sony hacks happen? The Sony hacks happened in 2000 and, when was that? The Sony hacks, 2014, 2012. When did the Sony hacks happen? When, when, when North Korea hacked the Sony studio and we found out that women actors were being paid, you know, 30, 40% less than the men stars of the same movies. So the idea that you could pay women, and I am not a feminist, I am not a feminist, I, <laughs> I'm an anti-feminist, I think feminism has, it, it, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like feminism, I'm not a big fan of it, even though there's women who are tougher than me, who can do jobs better than me, who are better CEOs than I am, who are better executives than I am, I am not pro-feminism at all whatsoever. However, for women who want to be in the workforce, who are better executives than I am, who are smarter than me, who can do business better than me, they should be paid the exact same or more depending on their qualifications. And this is coming from someone who's not a feminist. I am not a feminist at all, whatsoever. Not even close. Not even remotely close. I don't. I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I think. Fe my opinion on feminism is not relevant in this conversation. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not a fan. I'll put it to you that way, okay? And most of my family is feminist. So, you know, who I am is who I am. However, in 1937, Parrish, the maid in West Host Hotels, is being paid a very meager wage and she can't make ends meet. And so she sues the hotel and says, hey, no, look, I want to be paid a fair wage. And so Owen Roberts, he switches sides and why does he switch sides? And this gets right into the, the, the whole crux of the lecture today. What happened? Why did Owen Roberts switch sides and say that he was going to vote that states had the right to create a minimum wage for people who worked at different corporations? Why is it? How come it is? It goes back to the basic say, the, the basic fundamental fact that power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what had happened? Remember, 1931, 1932, we entered the Great Depression. Uh, Franklin Delano, so right here is gonna be the presidents. Right here, you got Franklin Delano Roosevelt's gonna come into office in 1933. We hit the depression at the end of Hoover's administration in 1930, 1932, 1933. So I believe the depression hits in 31, 32, and then um, Hoover's in, in office in the Depression, in the very end of the Depression. And then by the time Franklin Delano Roosevelt gets into office, the Depression is incredible. There are, there are lines for food. There, people are starving. It is a horrible situation. America is completely disheveled. We have spent all of our money on, on war. We spent all of our money on war. We spent all of our money on World War I, and then Hoover did, did some ridiculously stupid stuff. And that put us into a Great Depression. So uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt starts the New Deal. And in 1932, when he starts the New Deal, he can't get through any of his New Deal uh, policies. And why is that? How come, why can't Franklin Delano Roosevelt get through any of his New Deal policies? How come? Because, and you guys have to know this. You have to know this because... History always, always, always repeats itself. If you've seen anything I've taught, if you've watched any of my lectures online here, you see that history always repeats itself. And if you don't understand that, then my friends, we're doomed. I can't be the only one and I'm not. There's thousands and thousands of people who are contacting me who are telling me, I know everything you know, you're correct, 
Thank you for standing up and saying it. There's people who are far smarter than me who are sending me information that I'm so grateful that you're sending me information. And by the way, do not send me links. I cannot click on them. I will not click on them. I've been hacked. My accounts have been deleted. Um, <laughs> so, so, so now here's what happens. So when Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes into office, we're, we're in this great depression. We're, we're in this great depression. And what happens? And so now he can't get any of his New Deal policies pulled, pushed through because what's happening is Congress will write a law, the president will sign the law, and then the unelected Supreme Court will say, no, nope, it's unconstitutional. And so the con Congress will get a law written and then the, the, on the president's orders, they'll say, hey, he'll say, hey, write this up so we can get the New Deal going through. And so Congress will write the law up, Franklin Delano Rosa will sign the law into effect, and then the judiciary will void it and say, no, it's unconstitutional. And this goes on over and over and over for years. And this is how we overturn Terry versus Ohio. This is exactly how we do it. Because we're the, getting a, 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 a three quarters of the states to sign a 28th Amendment, which by the way, when I say 28th Amendment, it just depends on which historian or civil libertarian that you've spoken to who has written as the 28th Amendment something that they wanted to happen which the same thing that I've done. I've written the same thing. I've written the 28th Amendment elects our Supreme Court, right? We all have these grandiose ideas about how we can get an amendment passed, but the truth is to get an amendment passed, you have to have three quarters of the states ratify that, and you have to have a constitutional convention, and then you have to get an amendment passed. Well, let me tell you what FDR did. The country was in shambles, sound familiar? What year was that? 1932. What year is it today? 2022. We're 90 years. It's almost exactly cyclical. And we're almost exactly where FDR was 90 years ago, where our country, there's only a very top percentage who's making all the money and everybody else is working like a dog to keep up. As you guys know from the beginning of this broadcast, I said, I'm not going to go to a job as an executive. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing every time to go money up, work for some rich guy, run his company for a year, make a quarter million, and then come back into my passion. No, no. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to break off and go run someone else's company. I'm going to sell more posters. I'm going to sell more eBooks. So buy my poster. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Go buy my poster. Thanks. So now what Franklin Delano Roosevelt does is when he can't get his New Deal era of policies through because the judiciary continues to, to override it and say that, that, that the, 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 the law written by Congress and signed by the executive is unconstitutional. And this goes all the way back to Marbury versus Madison that we talked about yesterday, where we said that John Adams had sent out, had sent out John Marshall and created a bunch of writs to empower, and this is Marbury and Marbury versus Madison, and there's Madison there. And just so you know, uh, you know John Adams, his Secretary of State was John Marshall. And before John, <laughs> by the way, they call it someone. Someone sent me a DM, and it's, it's called the Organic Clause. The Organic Clause is also what's called the Midnight Appointment, where they appointed a bunch of Federalist judges. So I hope you're able to keep up here. I know I'm going pretty fast. I, I don't mean to talk over anybody's head here, but. So now right here, what FDR does in 1932 is, you know what he says? He goes, okay, if the judiciary refuses to allow my New Deal policies to go through the proper chain of command, to go through Congress and then to be signed by the executive and then be implemented because all power in America is derived from the people through Article 1. And so when FDR can't get his New Deal policies to get pushed through, what does he do? He says, if power is going to corrupt absolutely, then I'm going to pack the court. And it's amazing what happens when you tell a bunch of elitists that you're going to take away their power. Guess what happens? They all change their tune and they go, you know what? It's moral that we, we rule against Parish uh, West Coast Hotel and that we rule on the, on the side of Parish. She has a right to make a livable wage and that is the birth of minimum wage. How does that happen? It happens when FDR announces publicly, it's in the newspaper, that he's going to pack the court. That for every one judge who's over 70, they're going to replace that judge with a new judge. They're going to add a judge. And by the way, when you're over 70, over 80, you don't want anything to change. You like it how it is. 
You got your money, you got your houses, you got your ranch, you got your wife, you got your side chick. And back then, just so you know, in 1930, 1932, you could have a side chick that was in another, in, in one of the other states and you never got caught. <laughs> just a little fun. That's for you, uh, uh, Disorderly Product News. When he made my video and put Hulk Hogan in it, I was like, dude, that is so funny. So, so just adding a little brevity to it. But so in 1932, what, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt says is I'm gonna pack the court. And last year, two years ago, Joe Biden, let's go Brandon, uh, I, I, just so you know, I, I have, I, 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 how do I say that? Because I don't want to get into politics because when you start to talk about politics, you cut the room in half and the people on this side hate the people on this side, the people on this side hate the people on this side. Let me just say what I'm against. I'm against anybody forcing a mandate. And currently the administration in office today is trying to push through a mandate. And I've got a major problem with that because a mandate created the first prison industrial complex in America through the 19, 1919 Volstead Act, which would later become the 18th Amendment. Here. So this is the first rise, the creation of the industrial prison complex. I mean, we have less than 100,000 people in prison, even though slavery has been abolished for, for, for 65 years, from 1965 to 1920, 35, 40, 55 years. I'm a constitutional law scholar, not a mathematician. So, okay. So now what happens here is when a mandate's passed, we create the industrial prison complex that we have today. And then the next mandate of prohibition of drugs creates the, the, the mass incarceration complex that we live in today. And so, but with that being said that I'm not real up on this current administration who I did not vote for. I also did not vote for, the, for Trump. I didn't vote for him either. I voted third party like I have since 2008. So now, but what, what, what Biden had said was that we should pack the court and we should. If you guys saw any of my previous lectures uh, before my, my TikTok account was banned, I actually created a giant graphic and I said, we should break the court up, the Supreme Court into six different districts. And we elect nine justices that we can now call justices because they would have to run on a platform of liberty. And what do we know throughout the history of time? What do we know throughout the history of time? We know that when FDR wants to get his new deal policies passed in 1932, he tells them, I'm gonna take away your power. I'm gonna add more justices and you guys are not gonna have any power. The Mullen Commission of 1994. The Mullen Commission in 1994, when Bill Clinton says, I'm gonna order a commission, the commanders and lieutenants within all of policing start to clean up the act of the precincts because they know that oversight is coming. Because as soon as you tell people we're gonna diminish your power, change happens. And so this is the solution. This is the solution right here. We have to pack the court. We have to pack the court, okay? We've got to pack the court and the court has to be electable. Now that will take a constitutional amendment. Will it though? Because, because the, pres the, the, the court serves at the president's pleasure. Does, the, can, can you pop that up there, Stephanie? I believe it's um, Article 2, Section, section 9. Am I mistaken about that? I, I, I believe it's Article 2, Section 9. I think it is. I think, it's, I think it's Article 2, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Article 2, Section 9, where it says that the Supreme Court serves at the pleasure of the president. And so if we pack the court and we, you know, there's a case going through right now. There's a case going through. It's on Institute of Justice. It's on Institute of Justice. Good to see you, uh, uh, Crypto. Um, it's on Institute of Justice channel on YouTube. The way that we create fundamental change now, without having to go through a big constitutional amendment, without having to get a case before nine appointed prima donnas, right, is we have to pack the court, pack the Supreme Court. And not just with any people, but people who are elected. So remember, this is a bigger conversation. This is a bigger conversation. Okay. Um, Tommy, it's just really hard because, because it's, it's hard because remember, 
I'm just a regular old lame brain who just does all this crazy research. So it's, it's hard to do the same thing to, to interact at the same time, but I can try to take a couple questions. So go ahead. What, what question did you have, Tommy, that I wasn't able to get to? We have got to get this court pleasure of the president right there, right, right there. Which, what, 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 what section is that? I know it's article two. What section is that? Article one is going to be, it's going to be article two. What section is that? Stephanie, can you let me know that pretty please? I hadn't planned on talking about it, but, but, but I wanted to, I just wanted to get it. It's article two, section two, article two, section two of the constitution that the court serves at the pleasure of the president. And so if you and I together, if you and I are ever going to get liberty, if you and I are ever going to get freedom, we first have to get a Supreme Court that works for the people. And since the beginning of time, this court has not worked for the people. It's worked against us. It has worked against our civil liberties. It has worked against our Bill of Rights. It has worked against our freedom. It has worked against us from the beginning until the end, until now. Remember, there is a case going through right now, OSHA versus, does anybody know what that case is? OSHA versus Ohio? OSHA versus, versus it's, it's OSHA versus Pfizer. I, I'm not sure which one it is. But what it says is that the Supreme Court is going to take up the mandatory medication. And I don't want to use the wrong words here because I don't want my accounts to get flagged and taken down like my two TikTok accounts did where I lost all my outreach to, to those people. Um, where the Supreme Court is going to hold against us. If anybody here is against a mandate, is anybody here against a mandate? Is anybody here against a mandate? Anybody? Is anybody here against a mandate? Can you let me know? Are you against a mandate? I'm against a mandate. I'm 100% against a mandate. And so <clears throat> the Supreme Court is hearing the OSHA case, right? Yeah, against a mandate, against, 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 against. We're all against a mandate. And so the other day I made a video. I put it on my Instagram. You guys, please follow my Instagram account. It's a brand new account. Uh, you know, I'm a man with an, with an ego like anybody else. You know, seeing that I have absolutely no outreach on, on Instagram is, is just, uh, it's just crushing because I put so many years of work into what I'm doing so that I, now I have like 75 followers. People who are my friends and family haven't followed me back yet. And it's just, it just really hurts my feelings, I guess. I guess that's the best way to say it. You know, it's not really ego. It's more of uh, my feelings are hurt, you know, because uh, I was deplatformed um, and it does hurt. So, um, thanks. I appreciate it. So, so uh, my Instagram is Chili De Castro underscore 2022. So, so now, um, I got lost in my own feelings there for a moment. <laughs> so now listen, so now I want you guys to all be prepared for something. I want everybody who's in the room to be prepared. The OSHA case that is going to the Supreme court, the Supreme court has decided they've blessed us to listen to our case of OSHA that's taking on the mandatory global medication, they're going to rule against us. I want you guys to be prepared for that. The Supreme Court is going to push mandatory medications for everybody. That's what's going to happen. So if you're not ready for that, just prepare yourself. You heard it here first. In June of 2021, when I began to lecture on, YouTube, on, on TikTok, I told all those people because I had read all of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's cases. I had read every case Ruth Bader Ginsburg had written, whether she was the, the, in the majority, whether she was a majority with, with a dissent, whether she was majority concurring, whether she was concur, whether she was dissenting, whether she was partially concurring and dissenting. I read every single case that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote a word to. And so in 2021, in June, I outright came out and said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was horrifically bad. She was racist and she was terrible. And now, just so you know, in November of 2021, there are now articles being written that said Ruth Bader Ginsburg was terrible and she was racist. How did I know that in June? You can even check the videos. I'll post one from June that I made talking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg being horrifically bad and being a racist. And now it's coming out that she actually was. You know what? Was she racist? You know, because everything's so racist in today's world. Or did she just discriminate against hiring black people? She discriminated against hiring black people. She didn't have any black clerks 
Is that racist? I don't know if it's outright racist. I, that might be the wrong term because now that I've been branded a racist, if you guys haven't been to brandedaracist.com, you can watch the video over there. Now that I've been branded a racist, was Ruth Bader Ginsburg racist? Maybe not racist, but she certainly didn't uh, subscribe to, to, to hiring black people. She certainly didn't, you know, in Arizona versus Johnson, Johnson is a black guy. She writes the, the major, the unanimous decision against Johnson in Arizona versus Johnson, which I spoke on yesterday a little bit, that if you're the passenger in the car, you have to get out of the car in the name of officer safety and extension. Arizona versus Johnson is an extension of Terry versus Ohio, right? So you guys have to be prepared for what's about to happen. The supreme tyranny is going to vote against us and they're going to say that we should have mandatory vaccinations. That's what's gonna happen in the next few months. Just so you know, just be prepared for that. Don't think that the Supreme Court is gonna take up the case and they're gonna rule in the favor of the people because they're for liberty and justice. They're not, they're not. They work in collusion with the President of the United States. The Chief, Chief Justice Roberts, in, he was confirmed in 2005. Chief Justice Roberts worked in collusion with both Obama and Trump. Let me see, 2000, 2005. Let me, let, me, let me just double check. With, with uh, George W. Bush in, in 2005, with Barack Obama in 2009, and then Justice Roberts worked in collusion with Donald Trump in 2017. And so just so you know, when a, when a Supreme Court is, is set and then a new president comes in, the president goes to the chief justice of the Supreme Court and the president will tell the Supreme Court justice, here's what I want this agenda to be like for the next four years. And then Chief Justice Roberts, just so you know, when George W. George w. Bush was in office, George W. Bush, when, when Chief Justice was set in 2005, when he was uh, confirmed in 2005, George W. Bush went to him and said, hey, here's the cases I want you to really look at over your next four years, over your next eight years. And John Roberts, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said, yep, that's right. That's what we'll do then. And then Chief Justice Roberts, who had been one way until George Bush was out of office, in 2009, when Barack Obama came in, Barack Obama went to Chief Justice Roberts and said, hey, John, here's what I wanna go over for the next four years and then end up being eight years. And so John Roberts said, okay, Mr. President, we'll go over the cases you wanna go over. And then when Trump was seated in the White House, he sat down with John Roberts and said, hey, here's what I want the next four years to go over. And John Roberts said, okay, Mr. President, that's what we'll do. And that happens with every single Supreme Court, not just the one in the last few years. The president, the chief executive, and the chief justice of the Supreme Court work in collusion with one another. And we saw what happened when FDR couldn't get Hughes and couldn't get Taft, no, I'm sorry. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't get Hughes and he couldn't get Stone to, to do what he wanted to do. He then said, if you guys don't want what I, what I want to do, then I'm gonna pack the court. And what am I gonna do? I'm gonna strip away your power. So how do we affect this Supreme Court today to overturn Terry versus Ohio? How do we affect the Supreme Court today to overturn Terry versus Ohio? We have to take away their power. We have to pack that court. I mean, we do have to make the Supreme Court electable, just like we made senators electable with the 17th Amendment in 1913. We have to elect the Supreme Court. And if we don't elect the Supreme Court, <laughs> my friends, your children and my children, I don't have any kids yet, but your kids and my kids will live in a tyrannical you think it's a police state now? How many First Amendment auditors are in here? How many people do audits? How many people watch First Amendment audits? If you think it's tyrannical today, imagine what it's going to be like in 20 years. Which, 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 which by the way, I, I quit smoking weed. I'm not sure if you guys know that or not. I, I mean, I didn't quit altogether. I mean, I'll still smoke some weed now and then if someone's got some or something. But 
Nope, I had to quit. You're an auditor. So you think it's tyrannical now, it's gonna be even worse in a decade or two. It's gonna be even worse. It'll be far worse, it'll be far worse. We have got to make the Supreme Court electable or you and I, and by the way, this is how we overturn Terry. We overturn Terry by getting a new group of people in there who are on the side of the people. Let me ask you a question. I'm a cop watcher and an auditor. Yep, I, I read your, I saw a couple of your things yesterday, Stephanie. You know, when we give these people absolute power for life, then they don't, they're not beholden to you and I. The only Supreme Court personnel, the only Supreme Court personnel that was ever close to being impeached was Earl Warren. And why was Earl Warren almost impeached? Because of the 1963 holding of Matt versus Ohio. Good Lord. Here, right here. This is the reason why Earl Warren was, was almost impeached because of, of Matt versus Ohio in 1961. And what happened in, in 1961 is when Delore Mapp, when they raided her home and said that we had a warrant, but they didn't have a warrant, then they raided her house. She took her case and went to the Supreme Court. Delore Mapp was uh, a beautiful young woman. And when her case got to the Supreme Court, they held that police cannot just raid your house and violate the Fourth Amendment unless you get due process of the law, which is a warrant. And so the police around the country wanted to impeach Earl Warren because it stopped them from running roughshod over the citizens of America. Currently, today, Clarence Thomas wants to repeal, over, overturn Matt versus Ohio. Clarence Thomas wants to overturn it. Clarence Thomas wants to overturn Matt versus Ohio. Who? <laughs> Clarence Thomas is one of those people that when you read his holdings and read what he writes, you're just like, you are like, it's so frustrating. It is so frustrating. How do we have a guy like this on the Supreme Court? Because, because he didn't earn his position. He was appointed. And he's appointed for life, so he has no obligation to you and I. He has no obligation to you and I. Let me go through. Let me go through. How, how do we get qualified immunity taken away from police? So you know what, Let, let's talk on that for a moment, okay? I've, I've heard this comment now 10 times in comments about qualified immunity, and let me help you out real quick. Please don't be offended. Don't get upset with me. You're misguided. Nine out of 10 police stops are what? Terry stops. Ending 90% of qualified immunity. <laughs> I've read 20 comments, overturn qualified immunity, in qualified immunity. That's a great idea. First, let's get rid of a nine out of 10 police stops. Nine out of 10 videos you see start off as a Terry stop. Nine out of 10 people who are killed by police start off as a Terry stop. Nine out of 10 people who get taken to a dungeon and get strip searched and get abused and then have to go through the criminal justice system, have to go through probation, have to go through going through prison, start off as a Terry stop. So people who keep saying qualified immunity, hey, let's do this. Let's get the foot off the back of our head first, right? And then we'll worry about how deep the water is once we get into it. Because qualified immunity doesn't start until you're getting deep into the water. Qualified immunity doesn't stop until we're in the pool swimming. Let's stop the swimming from happening. It's, it's a pretty good analogy off the top of my head, right? Let's, let's stop the, 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 the deep end water from happening. And so look, do we want to end qualified immunity? Absolutely. But if we remember, and I talk about this all the time, Susan B. Anthony gave up her lot to fight for women's suffrage and she threw her effort into abolishing slavery. Why didn't she do both? Why didn't Susan B. Anthony work for women's suffrage and fight to, to end slavery? How come black men over the age of 21 got the right to vote with the 15th Amendment and women did not? Her whole effort, her whole mission in life was to get women the right to vote. She's not going to see it happen. It's not going to happen until 1920, and she dies in 1906, 1908. 
So how could, wh wh why didn't she say, hey, let's, why didn't she say, let's abolish slavery and get women the right to vote? Why didn't she say it? How come she didn't say it? Anybody? How come she didn't say, hey, let's abolish slavery and get women the right to vote? How come? Why didn't she? Why didn't she? How come? How come? Because you can only have one message. No justice, no peace, no racist police. To me, it's, 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 how do I say it without, without, to me, without being mean to people who are mentally challenged, when you say no justice, no peace, no racist police, I literally think that you're mentally challenged, that you don't have a brain in your head. What do you think the cops, the, 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 the cops who are racist, which is a small minority of cops, most of them are following police procedure, which the procedure of policing could be called inherently racist. Is the individual guy who signs up to be a cop, is he racist? He's told to go patrol the black neighborhood. He's told to go arrest black people. The policing apparatus itself is inherently racist. Are individual men and women who sign up to be cops, are they racist? Sure, some are. The majority of them are following police policy that they're told to do. And what are cops good at? Following orders, being authoritarians, and hurting you. But we can't say we wanna get women the right to vote and we wanna end slavery. Susan B. Anthony knew that. And so when her, when her, when her, um, when her petition went out to get people to sign her petition, it didn't say get women the right to vote and end slavery. It only said let's abolish slavery. No, I'm not saying cops are just doing what they're told and give them a pass. If you haven't seen my videos, they don't get a pass from me. And if you signed up to, be, to do that job, my friend, you and I are on opposite sides of the totem pole and you're in the ground because I have no respect for what you do. You sign up to do that, my friend, you are gonna go down in history just like the Nazi soldiers who are just doing their job. What I'm trying to say is, are individual people who join the Death Star, are they originally a racist? Sure, some are, sure, you bet. Are the majority thinking they're gonna join and do something good? Yeah, yeah, and that's really sad. When you sit down and talk to cops, and I've talked to thousands of cops, because I can sit down and talk with anybody, and they have told me they signed up to do good. The guy's not lying, it's just me and him. We're just sitting down talking like two guys. And he tells me, Chili, you know, I wanna do good, man. I, my mom got raped when I was a kid, and my dad was an alcoholic and a drug dealer, and I hated it, and so, so he signed up to be a cop because he wants to do good. What he doesn't understand is that he's joining a Death Star. He's joining a Death Star, and that Death Star will corrupt him. And that Death Star does have inherently racist policies because police were originally formed to get your slave back. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. You know, it's hard talking about the history of our country and knowing how much, how much racism was in it because everything can't be racist. It's not. However, some things are. Some things really are. So did, 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 we, did we put this to bed, this, this debate between qualified immunity and Terry versus Ohio? Did, did, we, did we put this to bed or do we need to flush it out a little further? Because look, I'm only one guy here standing here in front of a camera talking to you guys. I, 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 don't, I don't know everything, right? I'm just a regular old human being who I, I, I read LexisNexis, I, read, I watch Quimby videos, you know, I, I, I sign up for subscriptions, I spend my money, my time, my energy, my life into understanding the law and how we make this world a better place. Says the white guy. Um, Soy colombiano, pero yo vivo en Alaska 13 años. Mi papá es colombiano. My skin is brown. However, I live indoors most of the time, so my skin gets a little white. But uh, I'm Colombian. I was persecuted in my hometown for 13 years. I was chased by the cops, arrested by the cops, targeted by the cops because me amo Jose Maria. So don't tell me I don't understand racism, bro. I literally wanna take this stick and hit the camera when you say stuff like that. It just pisses me off beyond the pale because I actually experienced racism my entire life. My name is not Chili. My name is Jose Maria. My friends called me Taco. Chili became a shortened version of Taco. So don't tell me I don't understand racism, bud, says the white guy. 
Don't, 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 don't tell me I don't understand racism. I was jailed in a tiny little town of 2,000 people five times, put in a dungeon, strip searched five times. Okay. <laughs> okay. Don't tell me I don't understand racism, my friend. Just because you're black doesn't mean that you own the card to you understanding racism. It just, it, it, it just butters my biscuits. You know what I'm saying? Have I cursed yet? Have I cursed yet on this broadcast? I don't think I've cursed yet. I don't think I've cursed. Have I cursed yet? I hope I haven't cursed yet. I've tried not to curse. So, so, you know, as you guys say in qualified immunity, I want you to understand something that we can only have one message. We can, uh, uh, why were we put in jail? I was put in jail and targeted at high school parties, um, at, at, at bonfire parties in Alaska. When we go to a party, we drive down a dirt road, 20, 30 miles. We bring a bunch of pallets and then we just burn a big bonfire. I was arrested for minor consuming. I believe it's still on my record. I have a misdemeanor of minor consuming. That's one of the four times I was arrested for alcohol, for having a beer when I was 18 years old. True, true story, true story. And anybody from my hometown in, in Alaska will tell you and they will, they will let you know, I was specifically targeted because I'm Colombian because my name is Jose. So. When you say I don't understand racism and it says from the white guy, what are you talking about? Because you put me in the sun for just a few days instead of living behind an office and behind a computer, my skin gets brown as brown can be and I was targeted lots. So I'm not, I'm not a victim here. I don't live in that victim complex, but I'm just trying to say, I'm just trying to say, just, just, it just, it just, I'm, I'm a little bit salty with some black people right now who've called me a racist. I'm a little bit salty with, 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 with the whole racist ideology thing going on right now. So forgive me if I'm a little bit intense about it. Okay. Okay. Go over the vulnerabilities Terry V. Ohio creates during a stop. Okay. So the number one thing that Terry does besides just reasonable suspicion is it gives the police the right to detain you, to detain you. And now, so just so you know, the holding of Terry versus Ohio, it starts off by saying that the police can detain you in the name of officer safety and do a light frisk or pat down on you. The truth is, the truth is, is that police stations, in, just so you know, every state in America, every city, every municipality, every borough, they all have their own policy around Terry. There's no uniform policy for a Terry stop. Every different cop shop now, there is a federal Terry v. Ohio from the, the um, Department of Justice, I believe it comes out every year, that, that shows the, the, the pillars or the, the canons or the, the tenets of Terry versus Ohio. But the truth is, the truth is, is that every different cop shop in America gets to create their own specific rules of detainment based on Terry versus Ohio. And a lot of those detainment policies are get on your knees. The very first thing that you're told is that you will get on your knees, right? And so, which, which by the way, you know, apparently, apparently, um, that is not arrested. Telling you to get on your knees, to stop your motion, for you to get on your knees, get on your belly, for you to be handcuffed, that is not arrested. That's only detained. So there's that. There's that. And, and look, um, whoever said that, you know, says that from the white guy and I kind of came at you there. Sorry, dude. Look, I'm still super salty. You know what I mean? I was raised with a black uncle. Uh, when, when my, my, you know, if, and if I say anything else about black people, then I'm just trying to cover for myself. But just be being called a racist for this last couple months. I, I mean, I'm currently flirting with a, a black girl. It's just so stupid. It's just so stupid. It's just so stupid, you know? So it's, it's offensive to levels to me that I just, I take it extraordinarily personal because I was deplatformed, you know, 300,000 followers and hundreds of hours of videos were taken down based on people calling me a racist. And so when you tell me I don't understand racism, not only have I experienced racism when I was a kid, I'm experiencing it again today. When a, when, when a larger group that has more power over an individual or a smaller group of individuals asserts that power based on the color of that person's skin, that's racism. Let me say it again. When a large group of people or a group of individuals who have more power 
over an individual or a smaller group of people and they assert that power over that individual or group of people based on the color of their skin, that is racism, okay? And I'm currently experiencing racism. I'm not allowed to speak and center myself on civil liberties because that's a black issue according to the head of BLM in Utah who I talked about yesterday who I called her a dunce cap, which she is, she is. I watched your videos again last night just for fun, just to see what, how, oh, black people absolutely can be racist, 100%, 100%. Black people, brown people, pink people, orange people, yellow people, blue people, all people, if they discriminate against someone else based on the color of their skin, that is racism, and especially if they have the power dynamic. And this group of people on TikTok had more power than me. They discriminated against me based on the color of my skin. And so that's racism. That, that, that's racism. If right now there's me and one other person and there's someone who's a different color skin than us light brown people and we discriminate against that white person or that black person because of the color of their skin, that's racism. And if the two of us here have more power than that one person over there and we use that power to discriminate against that power, against that person based on the color of their skin, that is racism. That's racism. All people can be racist. Every person alive can be racist. And this idea that we all hold some kind of racism, I've heard that for so long. I went to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles and there's two doors. And when you walk up to the two doors, one door says, if you're not racist, walk through this door. If you are racist, walk through this door. And so everybody goes to walk through the door that says you're not racist, but it's locked. You can't get through it. You have to go through the door that says you're racist. And this is some leftist wacky bull, bull pucky ideology. I almost cursed for the first time on this broadcast um, because that's not true. That's not true. You know, throughout the, I talked to my, to my uncle David last night on Facebook. My uncle David is the black kid that my family adopted who my grandma adopted that we were raised together. I talked to him last night, two nights ago on Facebook, and we went back and forth and talked about our, our being childhood uh, chums and the neighbor kid I beat up when they called him the N-word, the whole thing, right? And he was like, you know, Chilito, he said, I never ever in my life saw you as racist. You never discriminated against me or anybody else. I remember you fighting for me. And actually he said he didn't remember some of those things, but he's three years younger than me. So when I beat up that neighbor kid, I was 12, David was nine, so he doesn't remember that. But I don't believe that everybody is inherently racist. No, I don't, I just don't. I think that there's more racist people than, 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 than there should be, for sure. I think that there are sundown towns in this country that should exist, that we, sh we should have more of a mix of people. But currently, right now, the racism that I'm experiencing from some black people I'm seeing it now where they're doing an all black graduation at Yale, an all black graduation at Princeton, an all black graduation at State College. And that to me, my friends, is, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. But I, I don't want to get lost on some racism conversation here. I just want to talk about the history of laws and how we can overturn Terry, which from my humble opinion is we should pack the court with elected personnel. That's what I think. That's what I think. Anyway. All right. I've been on for 73 minutes. Uh, I'll take any questions right now. Um, yeah, that's right. Racism is a group effort. Segregation. So, so look, you know, just so you guys know, just, just, just so you guys know, um, there, there, <laughs> how do I say that? How do I say that? That, uh, th there is a woman who I saw on a dating app who is, is as I think she's mixed race and I am flirting with her and she is beautiful and I'm flirting with her. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know, I invited her to watch this live. So I hope I didn't offend her with anything I said, but you know, it is what it is. You know, I'm just being honest. I'm just saying the whole truth. So there it is. You know, I don't see, I don't, I don't see people and look at them and go, Oh, you know, I'm going to discriminate against you because you're an Asian driver right? Which is the pretty common uh, stereotype as Asian drivers are bad drivers, but that's not true. That's not true. There's lots of Asians who are amazing drivers, you know, but what do we do? What, what, you know, what is the stereotype is we go, oh, that's an Asian driver, right? Like it must be a, an Asian woman driver, right? And then we discriminate against gender as well. Is that racism or discrimination, right? So you get into it. But anyway, I don't want to get lost on this. I've had to deal with this crap for the last two months and it makes me emotional. It makes me mad and I don't want to get into it again. 
Um, I really hope that that, that that girl I was flirting with, I hope she came by the broadcast and I got to see her. So that's, that's what I hope. Anyway, so do I have any questions? I'll answer any questions for two minutes. I'm going to watch some Monday Night Football. By the way, guys, uh, do me a favor. Go to my website, DeleteLaws.com. Think about getting my digital poster. If you guys want a coupon for $5 off, I'll give you $5 off. Uh, I'll give it to you for free, actually, <laughs> if you want the poster, if you want the digital poster. I have not got enough requests for digital posters. Even if you don't want to buy it, you should still ask me, say, hey, dude, can I get that poster for free? I haven't, the YouTube community hasn't said, hey, can I get an ebook for free or a poster for free? And I don't mind giving it away for free. I have not gotten any requests from YouTubers asking me for a free poster or a free ebook. And I will give it to you for free. For free. I've given thousands and thousands away. You have no idea. I sat there when I first started my channel, three or four hours just clicking, 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 giving away thousands of these posters and ebooks. And the YouTube community, number one, um, uh, the people who have bought it, and thank you so much, I appreciate it. But the people who have not, that don't have the 20 or 25 bucks, whatever the price is right now, dude, I'll give it to you for nothing, but get it. And then go spend the 30 bucks at FedEx office and get it printed out, put it on your wall, start talking to your friends about it. You know, I, I, I mean, I've got my Venmo and Cash app along the bottom of it. So when you get flushed one day, cool, Venmo me. Amazing, thanks. If you don't, that's okay too. But I have not got enough requests for free posters or free ebooks. I haven't got enough requests. I've gotten zero. No, no, that's not true. I got, I got one or two. I got one or two requests for free posters and free ebooks, but not enough. Not like on TikTok. I would get, I would get off TikTok live, and I would get, you know, a hundred requests for a free poster, and I sent them out. I sent them all out. So you guys need to get a free poster or a free ebook if you don't have the twenty bucks to buy one. I'll give it to you for free. And then someday when you're flush, hit my Venmo or Cash app for the price of the poster. Or don't, or don't. <laughs> it's not about me, man, it's about us. I mean, it's about saving our country before we go to a revolutionary war. It's about saving our country before we go to a revolutionary war. We are on the cusp of a revolution. If you guys didn't know that, we're on the cusp of an actual revolution. It is absolutely terrifying. This is probably why. That's probably why I was off. That damn heater was going the whole time. So you guys, uh, get my ebook or get my poster. If you don't want to buy it, get it from me anyway. You know, if you don't want to pay for it, that's fine. But get it and put it on the wall and talk to kids about it. Show the kids. The ebook is set up so that it shows the case on the top, and then it shows the the person who died from that case, and then it shows the judges responsible for creating that holding. Okay. It says, uh, my opinion, I would fine tune this poster some more. I wanna be able to follow connections more. I appreciate your work. Hey, listen, anybody great at Illustrator? If anybody's great at Illustrator, I am not. More than willing to accept any help. I'll give you guys my ebook and my poster for free for the help. I'm not really uh, flush right now. You know, my finances got cut off a couple months ago. So, uh, but if anybody's great at Illustrator, you know, anybody watching this YouTube live later, you're amazing at Illustrator. Would love to work with you. Would love to get your assistance. It's probably a couple days of work, you know? And then if we're able to sell more posters, I'll set up a revenue system for you guys so that you get a little a piece of the profit until you're paid your day rate for a couple days or whatever. If anybody's amazing at Illustrator and they're super passionate about, about understanding history and understanding um, uh, case law and understanding the, the, the history and the origins of law, more than willing to work with you if you're amazing at Illustrator. Now, the last person I talked to about being amazing at Illustrator, they weren't as amazing at Illustrator as they wanted to be, even though we did try some stuff, they just weren't quite at that level on Illustrator. It's tough, man, it's tough. There's, I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of pieces on an Illustrator file, and they're trying to figure it out. Um... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that was something nice someone said. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, if anybody's great at Illustrator uh, and you want to collaborate with me to make the poster even better, we'd love to work with you. And then uh, if, you, if you buy one, great. If you can't afford one and you're broke after Christmas, boom, hit me. I'll get it to you. Hit me. I'll get it to you. Okay. Okay. Cool. I appreciate that breaking the flaw. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Or thanks, uh, person. Uh, I don't want to you know, assign anything to you, but thank you, uh, human being. I appreciate that. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the current thing going on politically. So, so it's uh, uh, when that guy said the other day, and this, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to get off because I don't want a bunch of people fighting each other on here. This is going to be my last comment, and then I'm going to get off this thing. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, when Joe Biden the other day took a call on Christmas, and the guy on the phone said, "Let's go, Brandon," and then Joe Biden said, "Yeah, let's go, Brandon. I'm with you." I couldn't tell you how disappointed I was. I walked around the whole day whispering under my breath, going, who's running the country? If he said, let's go, Brandon, he literally is lost. That would be like me. People are calling me a racist over there on, the, on some of those people. Some of those people are calling me a racist, right? That would be like someone calling up my live right now and going, hey, Chili the racist. And I went, yeah, Chili the racist. Like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. That is crazy that he said, let's go, Brandon. That is absolutely crazy. That means he doesn't have the cognitive ability to hear something on the fly and then go, no, uh-uh, that's wrong. Who's running the country? That was his Reagan moment. If you don't know what I mean by the Reagan moment, Ronald Reagan had the same moment standing at the podium. He forgot what he was going to say. The person who runs the pharmaceutical company told him what to say, and then he said it. And then he said it. So, yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Uh, what's, what's Flaw's question? I'm sorry. Flat out hero, flat out hero, flaw. Le okay. Sorry, guys. I'm not, I, I have, my eyes are tough, man. I got to get to an ophthalmologist. Uh, Feral Kitty, Michelle, freelance. Can you repeat your question, Flaw? Can you repeat your question? Can you repeat your question? That was, that was real. <laughs> Flaw, I'll restate your question, please. I will try to get that, and then I'm going to get out because I don't want people fighting over politics. I don't ever talk about politics. I have not voted for a Democrat or Republican since 2009. I, I, do you think a state secession is a solution to federal tyranny laws? I think it's going to happen anyway. And I don't think it's going to be state. I think it's going to be local cities. I think when the Supreme Court screws us, which they're going to do, Everybody be ready when the OSHA case gets to the Supreme Court and they rule against us that we all have to take a mandatory medication that it makes us all guinea pigs. I think at that time, we're gonna see cities form, not states, but yeah, I think it is, it is a great question. I think we're gonna see cities form. Like I'm in the middle of nowhere in Arizona right now. As soon as they say mandatory medication, I think there's gonna be individual cities that form that ban government officials. I think that's what's gonna happen. And I'll be in one of those cities because I'm not taking that. I am not taking that. Not right now. I'm not anti at all. I'm more of, hey, let's do the proper clinicals for five years. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not an anti uh, B. I'm not an anti V. I'm, that's not what I am at all. I'm, I'm, I think that they do work over time if we get them proper. But by the way, a spiked RNA protein has only been around for how long? 30 years. So you're a guinea pig no matter what, right? So yeah, I'm anti-tyranny, you know. This 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 whole thing I'm going through, you guys, uh, so if you ever see me and I, and I seem like I'm a little bit off color, um, it's because of what I'm going through, you know. I still wake up to messages every day, people calling me a racist. I'm not a racist, but it doesn't matter. I'm going through it. So if I'm ever a little bit off, please try to have a little bit of compassion for me because... Yeah, yeah. It is more hurtful than you could ever possibly imagine. It is more hurtful and more painful than anything I've ever experienced as a man. Uh, people calling me a racist. It, it, is, it is the most painful thing I've ever experienced. So, you know, you know, so anyway, yeah. So if I ever seem a little off color, or if I say things that, that seem a little off-putting, just understand that I'm going through a lot. You know, I'm going through a lot. So forgive me if I've said anything that's offended you um, in race relations. I'm just experiencing a lot of pain right now and uh, I'm just pushing through it. And so before I break down and start crying on this broadcast, let me get out of here because, you know, you know, I, I do cry. I cry all the time because it hurts. It hurts. When people who I've been friends with for years don't re-add me back on Instagram, you would think that, you know, that wouldn't hurt your feelings, but it sure does because then I think in my head, do they think I'm racist? 
Like, like, does that person who I've, my best friend who's black called me tonight, called me tonight. He lives in New York. He called me from LA. He's dying for me to get back and do some jujitsu with him. He called me tonight. And the first thing he said is, Hey, Chile, I just want to let you know you're a racist. <laughs> I said, thanks T. And he goes, he goes, yeah, man, I was going to call you up and just call you a racist and hang up and how you doing? <laughs> and I was like, all right, bro. So anyway, I just want to let you guys know if I ever say anything that seems like it's a little bit not me, it's because it's not. I'm just going through some stuff. So anyway, uh, let me pull this back. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think we're going to have some some sanctuary cities from the government form when the Supreme Court rolls against us in the OSHA case. That's what I think. So you guys, once again, I want to thank you guys so much. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks for letting me talk. Um, I appreciate the space where I get to talk here for a second. Um, um, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the live comments and I'm going to try to address anybody who I may have offended because I'm, I got an edge on me right now, man. I'm upset. So, you know, with that being said, nothing but love for you guys. Uh, Merry Christmas. Thank you, dude. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, by the way, uh, uh, disorderly products is pretty good. James Freeman is pretty freaking good. You know, if I could be as calm as I'm, I'm a big, I think I'm a bigger jerk than James Freeman is. Uh, but James Freeman is incredible. Disorderly is incredible. Uh, Auditing America, uh, those guys uh, with his high squeaky voice, you know, with his Puerto Rican accent. You know, I think that I literally hate racism so badly that the reason why I loved Auditing America so bad is I know that when he talks with his accent I'm like these, it drives people who are racist, it drives them crazy. And that's why Auditing America was one of my favorite auditors and still is. He's still one of my top top five or six favorite auditors. Um you know, so I love that. I love hearing him talk. And I know that it drives some people crazy who are racist. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. anyway. Um, all right. If you guys have any questions for me and don't be afraid to ask me for a poster or an ebook, I would love to build a bond with you as I give you an ebook or I give you a poster. It's not a hard copy. It's a digital copy. It does not bother me at all. What bothers me is that people are not saying, hey, I want one. That's what bothers me. That hurts me more. Because then, you know what? Teach on your house and say, hey, this guy's Venmo. Send him 10 bucks. Thanks. Thanks. If not, cool, right? I'm just, I'm just, you know, we got to just get it out there. And then that'll help me. That'll help me as a person. So anyway, all right. And I'm breaking the flaw. Great last question, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Auditing America has a, you know, but look, by the way, you know, it's easy to say Auditing America has some, some beefs with different people, but guess who else does? Guess who else has called up YouTubers and said stupid stuff to them? Guess who else has put their foot in their mouth? Guess who else has, has said and done things that made them seem like they were not cool? Guess who else called YouTubers and said, hey, you're not doing it right? Me. So before I point my finger over at Anselmo, I got to realize that there's three more fingers pointing back at me. So Anselmo is, has his own personal problems as a human being, but don't we all? So, so yeah, anyway, so there it is. Anyway, you guys have any questions for me? Don't hesitate to reach out to me. Please get a poster. Please get an ebook. Even if you can't afford one, I'll give it to you for free. All right. And thanks for your time. That was a really emotional last five minutes. Thanks for letting me get through it. I appreciate it. All right. All right. God bless you guys. See you soon. Yeah.